Chapter 13, Dana Levinson. One of the problems of living in Colorado is the time zone. When my friends in the East text me in the morning, my phone can start going off as early as 5 a.m. As scientists, mom and dad have a scientific solution. Power down my phone at night. Right, like that's going to happen. I'm fast asleep when the ping goes off. Delirious, I roll over and tap the screen. Yikes, 5.53. I don't have to open my eyes for two more hours. But they open on their own when I see that it's a text from my camp friend Angela in New York. We go to sleep away together every summer. Camp Angie. OMG, just realized I'm so sorry. Dino Dana. Huh? Camp Angie. Choke Cherry, Colorado. That's you, right? Dino Dana. So? In answer, she texts me a link. I click on it and it takes me to the YouTube channel of the vlogger Real Talk. His extreme close up unibrow glares out at me, looking like it's been crammed into a too small jam jar. Here's the latest from Choke Cherry, swastika capital of Colorado. News flash. This idyllic American small town where you can smell the apple pie cooling on the windowsill used to be a hotbed for the KKK. We've been threatened with a lawsuit, Talk Nation, by the Chamber of Commerce of Chokecherry, Colorado. Why? For telling the truth. For daring to mention the Night of a Thousand Flames when the entire town was encircled by burning crosses. I click out of the video and stare at the conversation with Angela suddenly aware that I'm breathing hard. Well, of course Angela thinks I'm trapped in a neo-Nazi horror town if real talk is her only source of information. But even in the middle of all this business with the swastikas, Chokecherry doesn't feel like a racist place. True, somebody must be racist because the swastikas are obviously coming from somewhere, but most of the kids at school hate what's been happening. Every day, a large number of volunteers show up to work on the paper chain. There are so many of us now that Caroline and Michael had to move the production from the art room into the gym, and parts of the chain are draping over everything. You can barely see the climbing apparatus. We're already up over 6,000 links. But how can I explain all that to Angela? She's never lived in a place that didn't have a large Jewish community. So I text her back. Dino Dana. You can't believe everything you hear from Adam Talk. Camp Angie. But I'm worried about you. You're the only Jewish family in that town. Dino Dana. Not true. There's this one other kid. My finger freezes over the send button. Am I really saying what I think I'm saying? Dino Dana. He's studying for his bar mitzvah. It's weird. Nothing is funny about Choke Cherry, but for some reason, I'm laughing too hard to get back to sleep. My father is still driving Ryan and me to school every morning. That's one ongoing effect of the swastikas no matter how many times I tell Angela everything's la-di-da. How's the paper chain coming along? Dad asks after we drop Ryan at the elementary. I'm surprised. You know about that? The school sent an email blast to all the families, he explains. Interesting idea. As a parent, I'm behind it 100%. As a scientist, well, the math doesn't exactly seem realistic. Yeah, Mr. Bredamus reminds us of that about every eight seconds. It's supposed to be more about trying than succeeding. So long as you understand that, Dad confirms, because six million is an impossible task. The whole point, I tell him seriously, is so we can see how big a number six million really is. He goes kind of quiet digesting that. My dad's a smart guy, and it takes a lot to make him rethink something. This whole paper chain project is starting to get under my skin, in a good way. There's a traffic jam at student drop-off. Caroline spread the word that the gym would be opening early for paper chaining, and I guess a lot of kids are taking her up on it. I strand Dad in the line of cars and run into the school. The hall outside the gym is crowded with a mix of volunteers and spectators, and when I make it to the doors, I can see that the inside is a mob scene. It all revolves around Michael, who is standing at the center circle, clipboard in hand, shouting at Caroline. If the workers don't check in their output, then I can't count it. And if it doesn't get counted, how are we going to know how many we have? I can see what Michael's worried about. It's total chaos in the gym. There must be a hundred kids, probably more. Five of those guillotines, 
borrowed from the public library, the community college, plus our own elementary and high schools, slice construction paper with machine-like efficiency. No sooner have the strips been cut than fists fight over them. They're looped into shape and glued together, added to dozens of mini chains all around the room. Eventually, the mini chains are attached to bigger chains as poor Michael scrambles around, desperately trying to keep up with the count. I'm getting exhausted just watching it happen. It's impressive and a little bit scary at the same time. Spectators ring the gym, cheering on friends. Check out Sarah, her hands are just a blur. More glue, more glue. Link and Jordy have the best crew. They're churning out chain twice as fast as anybody else. Whoa, Oliver's bleeding all over the construction paper. Too much glue. What a waste of time. All this over a few swastikas. I feel like I'm on a leash and somebody yanked it. Some tall eighth graders are standing behind me. I identify the speaker right away. This kid, Eric Fedorov. He's supposedly the link rally of eighth grade. Mr. Popularity, basketball star. I eavesdrop on their conversation. They're big complainers. Their gym is being hogged by a bunch of do-gooders. Where are they supposed to shoot around before school? Sixth and seventh graders will volunteer for anything, blah, blah, blah. It's Eric who keeps bringing the topic back to two points. One, the paper chain project is stupid, and two, the swastikas are no big deal. I must flinch because they notice me. What's her problem? I hear Eric whisper behind my back, and one of his buddies supplies the answer. That's Dana, you know, the Jewish girl. Nothing's changed. I'm still watching the paper chain activity, but my neck is stiff, my jaw is clenched, and my good feeling about the project has turned to acid in my mouth. All I can think of is this is the town where the KKK found a home 40 plus years ago. This is a school someone is defacing with swastikas practically every day. For all I know, it's Eric himself or one of his obnoxious friends. The nine o'clock bell can't ring soon enough for me. I sleepwalk through my morning classes. When I head for my locker to dump my books and get my lunch, Link is standing there waiting for me. Didn't see you in the gym this morning. He says it like it's an accusation. By the time I got there, you were all full up, I explain. I figured I'd just get in the way. That's when I noticed that, in addition to his brown bag lunch, he's carrying a folder with Hebrew writing on it. So I've started working on my bar mitzvah stuff, he tells me. Well, duh. He spends every spare minute chanting away, trying to copy the prayers Rabbi Gold keeps sending him. He's at it in homeroom, the cafeteria, even while paper chaining. The rabbi texts him audio clips, and Link follows along on paper with the Hebrew blessings spelled out phonetically. And, I prompt, it's harder than I thought. Because it's a whole other language and all that. Nobody's making you do it, I remind him. He looks stubborn. I'm making myself do it. It's important to me. And since you've already been mitzvahed, or whatever they call it, I fold my arms in front of me. They call it becoming a bat mitzvah. It isn't something that happens to you, like getting struck by lightning. Anyway, he persists. I figured you could help me out. A bar or bat mitzvah is the happiest day in a Jewish kid's life, I tell him. You know why that is? Well, it says on the internet that you get a lot of presents, but that doesn't really apply to me. It's not the presents. It's the fact that it's over, done, and you don't have to do it ever again. So I can't help you because the minute I finished my own, I deliberately erased every trace of it from my brain. He doesn't smile. A Jewish kid would smile, but Link isn't your average Jewish kid. The problem is I've got no one else to ask, he says. All my Jewish relatives, I mean the ones I would have had, never got the chance to be born, I finish in my head. The Holocaust took care of that. I feel lower than snail slime. I'm just kidding, I sigh. I'll help you any way I can. I wish the 600 Link Rally worshipers in this school could see their big man on campus practically groveling with gratitude. So I get my lunch and sit down at a secluded cafeteria table with the most popular boy in the seventh grade for Hebrew lessons. Every girl in the room stares in envy. If they only knew. Pamela and Sophie glare at me from their spot opposite Jordy and Pouncey, their eyes shooting sparks. I wasn't lying about blocking my Hebrew education from memory, but it's amazing how fast it comes back. 
The prayers aren't quite songs, but there is kind of a chanting melody to them. I try to help Link with the tune, and he struggles to get the hang of it. I have to say, I'm a little bit impressed at how hard he's working. Part of me always believed that this whole bar mitzvah thing was kind of a goof for him. He has that reputation. The school halls echo with tales of his hilarious pranks pulled off with the faithful Jordy and Pouncy at his side, the snowball filled with peanut butter caper, the salt in the teacher's room coffee affair, the lard in the parade route incident. It's reached the level of legend around here, but Link seems to be 100% serious about learning his part for December 4th. No matter how bad he does, he buries his face in his papers, cranks up Rabbi Gold on his phone, and gives it another try. As we work, I notice that kids are getting up and rushing to the cafeteria windows. I peer outside, where a crowd is forming on the front walk. My heart sinks. Another swastika. It was only a matter of time before somebody stuck one right on the front of the school, where it's impossible to hide it. I look again. The spectators are gathered around a short, youngish man who is walking from his car, which is parked in the no parking zone where the buses pick up and drop off. He looks kind of familiar, but I can't quite place him. Whoever he is, he seems to be a big draw. Kids are swarming all around him, coming from every door in the school. There are even a few teachers out there trying unsuccessfully to herd their students back inside. Link is oblivious to this, still buried in his bar mitzvah. I tap him on the shoulder. Do you recognize that guy out front? The one pulling the tripod out of his car? His brow furrows for a moment, then his eyes widen. Is that real talk? No way. But it occurs to me that I've never seen the real Adam talk. Just the letterbox view from the top of the eyebrows to the bottom of the lower lip. I squint to squeeze his face into the tiny frame I'm used to on YouTube. The unibrow seals the deal. You're right. But what's real talk doing here? Link asks in amazement. I know the answer to that. He's here for our swastikas. He's been making a big deal out of it for a couple of weeks now. I'll bet he came to get a story for his YouTube channel. Look, he's setting up a camera. It's my fault, Link admits. I showed my dad real talk screaming about Chokecherry, and now the Chamber of Commerce is threatening to sue him. Let's get out there. We run through the cafeteria doors and join the throng around the famous blogger. Besides the claustrophobic rectangle of face he shows the online world, Adam Talk is compact and squat, with curly black hair and stick-out ears. He's casually dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt, and for some reason, authentic leather cowboy boots with gigantic heels that boost him up to merely short. He's speaking into his camera when we get there. It took a four-hour plane ride and three hours of driving on mountain roads, but here I am in God's country. Any town, USA. I haven't seen any swastikas yet, but have faith, Talk Nation. Chokecherry won't let us down. He pauses the recording and surveys the crowd. Is there a Caroline McNutt here? That's me. Caroline pushes her way to the front. Mr. Talk, on behalf of the student council, he cuts her off. Show me this paper chain you've been posting on Instagram. Oh, sure, Caroline enthuses. We're working on it in the gym. Mr. Bredema storms across the lawn and confronts the vlogger. You have no right to photograph my students. You can't use those pictures without permission, and believe me, you won't get it. Real Talk holds out his hand. I'm Adam Talk. The principal's face flames red. I know exactly who you are, Mr. Talk, and you're not welcome to come here and exploit our problems. This is the real world, not YouTube. You need a permit to film on school property. And if that's your vehicle, I regret to inform you it's illegally parked. Halfway through the speech, the vlogger turns on his camera and swivels it toward Mr. Bredamus. Here's Nicholas Bredamus, principal of Swastika Middle School, trespassing on freedom of the press. He narrates, students, Mr. Bredamus addresses us, get inside the school immediately. A few kids start to straggle back to the building, but most of us just stand there fascinated. The principal may be in charge, but Real Talk is a celebrity. A police car is coming up the street, followed by a tow truck marked Chokecherry Department of Public Works. Mr. Bredemus hurries to the curb to confer with the officer. The blogger is about to get his car towed, and maybe even be arrested, but it doesn't seem to bother him. I guess when your job is to get attention on the internet, all publicity is good publicity. Come on, Link tells me, let's go do some more work on my bar mitzvah. 
bar mitzvah. Real Talk pulls a notebook from his pocket. My research shows only one Jewish student at this school, and it's a girl. It's kind of a long story, Link explains. The blogger beams at him. I like long stories. There's a loud clunk as the tow truck operator hooks a chain to Real Talk's rental car. The blogger pulls his camera off the tripod and makes sure to get the whole thing on video. That's what I love about small towns, he narrates. Everyone's so friendly. Chapter 14. Real Talk. From the YouTube channel of Adam Talk. Interview with Lincoln Rowley. 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 Any relation to George Rowley from the Choke Cherry Chamber of Commerce? He's planning to sue me, you know. Yeah, sorry about that. He's my dad. Don't apologize. I love being sued. It gets me headlines. I love headlines. Headlines mean followers and followers mean ka-ching, ka-ching. He gets really touchy about anything that makes the town look bad. Like an army of screwballs and sheets burning crosses. That was a long time ago. Some people say it never happened. I'd think you'd have a stronger opinion on that considering you're Chokecherry's newest Jewish citizen. Yeah, should I tell the audience about my grandmother and the Holocaust? Talk Nation is more than just an audience. They're Talk Nation because they see through the idiotic, phony blabbery of a world that's 98% Baloney. I already told your grandmother's story in my last video. So, Lincoln. People call me Link. Oh, like the links in your famous paper chain. Not for nothing, but my video about the paper chain got quite a response from Talk Nation. But why don't you tell us a little bit about this pretend bar mitzvah you've been planning? It's not pretend. It's with a real rabbi in a real temple in Shadbush Crossing. My friend Dana has been helping me learn my part. She's Jewish, too. I've got big news, Link. I've already talked to Rabbi Gold, and Real Talk will be live streaming your bar mitzvah to Talk Nation and the entire world on December 4th. What do you have to say to that? Wow, awesome. Kind of scary, though. If I mess up, millions of people are going to know. Only the ones who speak Hebrew. I guess. Still, I was nervous already, but this will be like being on TV. Piece of cake for a kid with guts like yours. After all, you picked a pretty scary time to be Jewish in Chokecherry, Colorado, with so many swastikas popping up at your school. And even after all these weeks, nobody knows who's doing it. Does that make you want to reconsider your decision? Not really. You don't pick who you are. You just are. Chapter 15. Caroline McNutt. I deserve this. Ever since I was four, when I tried to organize my fellow preschoolers into going on strike for better cookies at snack time, I've had the same problem. Apathy. Nobody cares. Sure, they'll go to a dance or a party, but they won't lift a finger to organize one, and if that means it never happens, that's just fine with them too. I've been in student government since the first grade. Getting anybody to join a club or volunteer for a committee or do anything at all is like having your teeth pulled out one at a time by needle nose pliers. Until now. The Paper Chain Project is a student government dream come true. Picture all the student participation I haven't been able to drum up over the years cashing in at the same time with interest. You should see the gym. No, scratch that. You can't see the gym. Not much of it anyway. It's a paper chain jungle. Michael says we're up to over 60,000 links, and lengths of chain hang everywhere, doubled, tripled, and quadrupled up. When the volunteers come, it's wall-to-wall -wall people. I watched the whole thing in motion. Everybody busy, hundreds of kids banding together, working side by side to accomplish a single worthwhile goal. Sometimes I'm so overcome with gratitude that I have to remind myself, this is my reward. For all those years of begging and pleading, trying to whip up enthusiasm and getting nowhere. I guess it's a shame that it took swastikas to inspire the kids of Chokecherry to get off their butts. But the end result is more than worth it. For the first time in my life, I'm proud of my school. A bad thing happened to us, is still happening to us, and we turned it into the ultimate good thing times a million. Not only that, but we're getting kind of famous. Nowadays here in town, Real Talk is vlogging about our school full time. A lot of the local big shots like Mr. Berdamus, Mayor Radisson, and Mr. Rowley aren't too thrilled about it. 
It doesn't reflect well on Choke Cherry that somebody has been putting swastikas all over the school and we can't catch who's doing it. The adults hate Real Talk so much they won't even let him onto school grounds. But Mr. Talk is pretty sharp. On his show yesterday, he said, I've been thrown out of the White House by Secret Service. I've been banned from Buckingham Palace by Beef Eaters. Taylor Swift sicked her dog on me. The commander at West Point threatened me with a flamethrower. What do I care that some small town principal doesn't want me in his school? LOL. So he sets himself up in the little park across the street. He knows exactly how close to campus he's legally allowed to be, and he's three inches past that, so the police can't touch him. He's got a giant beach umbrella and a folding chair with a cup that always has a big gulp from 7-Eleven, who lets him use their bathroom. And there's usually a lineup of kids who can't wait to be interviewed. Students, Mr. Berdamus tells us on the morning announcements, I urge you all to stay away from the individual known as Real Talk. He's only interested in sensationalizing the problems we've been having in order to attract viewers to his vlog. He's presenting our school and our town in the worst possible light. The last thing any of us should be doing is helping him accomplish that. That day, the lineup in front of Real Talk's tripod is twice as long. Who can resist the chance to be on one of the most popular channels on YouTube? The principal's right that Real Talk is pretty harsh in his videos about the swastikas. In his opinion, we're either racist or stupid. Stupid because our police can't find one lousy kid. Racist because maybe they're not really looking. And then the vlogger never misses a chance to remind everybody that Choke Cherry was once a hotbed of KKK activity. He mentions the Night of a Thousand Flames in every posting. My mother thinks the problem with Real Talk is he's too negative. If he's so interested in our town, he should be telling the world about the good things that are going on here, like our annual mac and cheese eating contest. That raised a lot of money for charity. Or the dinosaur dig in the mountains. The university says it might turn out to be one of the biggest finds in history. Why does everything have to be about swastikas? I don't even try to explain it to mom. Swastikas are news, and swastika news means paper chain news. Mr. Talk hasn't actually seen the paper chain since he's banned from school property, but I texted him some pictures, and I'm glad I did. He used them in a few videos, and you wouldn't believe the response. On Real Talk's website, there are already more comments about our paper chain than any other topic. People love it. Sure, there are a few cranks who think the idea is stupid or that we ripped it off from the paper clip school in Tennessee. Some say the whole thing is a waste of time because we'll never reach six million but the vast majority are pro-paper chain. They say it's the perfect response to the swastikas in our school. A lot of the messages come from middle school kids all over the country, encouraging us to keep working and never give up, which is what we're going to do. This is the kind of activity student government was born to do. So when I hear my name on the PA system being called to the principal's office, I'm psyched. It's been nothing but good news ever since this project started. I know for a fact that Choke Cherry Middle School has never seen this level of participation for an extracurricular activity. Even Mr. Berdamus has to admit that the negative of the swastikas has been turned around by the positive of the paper chain. I figure, at minimum, I'm about to get a pat on the back. Who knows, for an achievement like this, I might even be elevated from 7th grade president to president of everybody. I can't help grinning at the thought of Daniel Faraz's face when he gets that news. So I'm a little confused by the look of sympathy on the secretary's face when she shows me into Mr. Berdamus' office. Michael is already there, sitting very small in a chair, looking devastated. The principal is gray-faced and grim. What's going on? We've got the hottest middle school activity in the country right now, and everybody's acting like this is a funeral. I perch at the end of the empty chair, and Mr. Berdamus gets right to the point. I can't commend you enough for what you've accomplished with the paper chain project. To reach 60,000 links is impressive enough. To manage it so quickly is astounding. It makes it all the more difficult to have to bring it to a close. A close? My heart practically busts through my ribcage. You mean stop? Why? We're kicking butt. I mean, it's going so well. Too well, the principal says. In fact, we've run out of construction paper. Can't we borrow some from the other schools? Even as I'm asking the question, I see Michael shaking his head sadly. We already have, the principal informs me. 
We've used every scrap of construction paper in the whole district, and there's no money in the budget to purchase more. We can fundraise, I squeak. We'll sell raffle tickets and scented candles and chocolate bars. I'll sell my bike. I'll do anything. Please don't cancel the paper chain. Sorry, Caroline, it's already done. And just like that, it's over. The greatest student government project in the history of school. Believe me, I don't let it go that easily. I offer to go door to door for donations and pass the hat around the cafeteria. I beg and whine and even cry a little. What's so hard about raising money? The principal's gold cufflinks alone would bring in hundreds. But he's a mule and eventually I'm so upset that I don't know what I'm saying anyway. Out in the hall, Michael tries to cheer me up. It was pretty cool while it lasted. We've got a lot to be proud of. Don't you dare make me feel better, I snap. What kind of message are we sending? Swastikas are bad, but only till you run out of paper to fight against them. And now that we're broke, they're okay? How's that something to be proud of? Well, I don't think Mr. Berdamus meant it that way, he offers. I stomp away from him. I refuse to spend my time with anybody who doesn't think this is the end of the world. If I have to listen to a guy putting a positive spin on this, my head is probably going to explode. At this moment, I want nothing but gloom, despair, negativity, and complaining. But where am I going to find that?